Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. You'll also find our archives, where you can listen to every episode we've ever done going back to 2006. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is December 8th, 2015, and my guest is Robert Frank, the Henrietta Johnson Lewis Professor of Management and Professor of Economics at Cornell's Johnson Graduate School of Management. He's the author of many books. Bob, welcome to welcome back to Econ Talk. Yeah, nice to be on with you again, Russ. Now, if all goes as planned, this episode will be released on January 4th, 2016. And as we have in the past, we're surveying EconTalk listeners to find out more about you and to let you vote for your favorite episodes of 2015. So head over to econtalk.org, econtalk.org, and in the upper left-hand corner, you'll find a link to the survey. Now, for today's episode, uh, with Bob's cooperation, we're going to try to do something a little different. Uh, We're going to reprise, revisit, and we hope extend an episode we did very, very long ago, back in 2007, which was based on uh, his book, The Economic Naturalist, a book I really enjoyed. And both of us like puzzles for teaching economics. And we're going to take some of our favorite puzzles today with the idea that if we talk about these on occasion or have episodes like this that are puzzle-oriented, you, the listeners, will get some insights into the economic way of thinking that you might not otherwise get from just uh, our usual style of interview. Uh, we're going to try to go into more depth, as I said, than we did the first time. But I've forgotten most of that 2007 episode, Bob. I, I had literally uh, forgotten any of the details. I certainly knew we had talked about your book once. But this is a general problem in economic education, correct? That's right. It's a problem for us as we get older. You know, We may have <laughs> talked about it a few years ago, but it's as if we're starting all over again, isn't it? And I assume... Uh, We have some listeners who – I know we have listeners who weren't around in 2007 and didn't know about that episode. So they're going to – some of you will go back. That's fine. And some of you heard it the first time, but I suspect after eight years, all of you have forgotten some of it. But what what you've argued is that the standard economics class is forgotten uh, uh, very quickly. It's an astonishing thing, really, Russ. The the studies that have been done of this show that – Six months after our students take the introductory course, they can't answer questions that probe their understanding of basic principles any better than students who never took the course at all. Zero value added as far as we can measure. Uh, that's, that's a really shockingly low level of performance, I think you have to admit. Yeah, assuming it's true, uh, which I'll t- let's take it as true for now. Obviously, it depends on the kind of course. I, I I don't think that's true of every course, but it's certainly true, I would think, of certain kinds of courses that emphasize m- memorizing definitions, multiple choice exams, um, certain equations and their relationship with economic variables. I'm not surprised that those um, – that the knowledge of those doesn't persist, although I am surprised that people who have never taken the course before could have any chance of getting any of those. So – uh, well, actually, <laughs> there, there, there's a former student of mine who gave economists a question about a simple question, really, it seemed to me, about opportunity cost of attending a concert. And oh, yeah. We've talked about that, the, that, that problem. On this the economists before. got it wrong uh, just as, as frequently as, as students got it wrong. The, the students who had never taken any economics were more likely to get it right than the students who had. Yeah, so I think it's, it's, it's really a, a – probably your course, they do better. I, I'm going to claim in my course they do better. But, uh, you know, these, these are uh, thousands of courses being offered around the world, and the, the overwhelming finding is that students really don't acquire or retain much in the way of basic knowledge about our discipline. And I think – that's that's uh, partly as, as a as you say what we choose to throw at them, but it's how much we throw at them. I think the the typical instructor walks into the classroom 
asking how much can I cover today? And then when he's flashed a, a, a hundred slides on the screen and <laughs> in, in the course of 50 minutes, he feels really productive, but you know, that's not the right question to be asking. Yeah. I always got in trouble because I would, it would be close to the midterm and students would come into my office panicky because we've only, had only covered two or three chapters of a 27 chapter book. And they figured that the second half of the class would be 24 chapters. And I assure them, <laughs> We're only going to cover about four or five because those are the ones I find interesting. Those are the ones I think will change the way you maybe look at the world that will help you understand the world. Uh, but it, I was not a very good surveyor of economic theory and when I taught micro because I didn't find Well, you shouldn't be, though. I mean, there are really only a half a dozen ideas that do <laughs> the serious lifting in our discipline. And, and you can't learn those except by doing them over and over again in different settings. And, and seeing a thousand uh, little ideas doesn't help you learn the six big ones. Yeah, my favorite course evaluation was uh, I got a one out of five from an angry student who said, Professor Roberts is a horrible teacher. He expected us to be able to apply the material to things we'd never seen before. And, I, and <laughs> yeah, I know it's funny, Outrageous. kind of tragicomic, but – and I warned them that that, you know, I told them that was the goal of this class. But I think it's very hard. Economics is, is difficult. The economic way of thinking, not not so much economic theory. It's difficult in a different way. Um, my other favorite quote from a student is who, who told me that she wanted me to make the class really hard. And to her, that meant lots of calculus. But to me, it meant lots of thinking of a different kind. Right. And – if you want to learn the economic way of thinking and apply it to areas that you haven't seen before, to see the similarities in a problem, to know which concept of those six or eight uh, you, ha you should be thinking about, you have to drill a little bit, not in what the facts are, not in the definitions, uh, not about the ratio of the prices and the marginal rate of substitution, but rather in thinking like an economist, which is – does it, as you say, doesn't even come naturally to some economists. Here's a question that grows out of the ineffectiveness of the principal's course, which is why don't parents sue the universities for taking $40,000 a year of their money and then teaching students economics in a way that <laughs> doesn't really add any value? I, I think uh, a, a reasonable guess at an answer to that one is that uh, since none of the people that we've turned out over the decades knows any economics either, the fact that our students go out into the world not knowing any isn't really evident to people. So uh, if, they, if they realize that we were charging them $40,000 and not adding any value, then I think we would see some lawsuits. You know, a lawyer does a bad job, he gets sued. A doctor does a bad jo job, she's dragged into court. First thing she knows, why not economists? Yeah, I think, um, well, I guess there's two ways to approach this problem. Uh, one, I want to think about the students first. Uh, the, you know, the parents don't have the best idea of what's going on in the classroom, but the students usually do if they show up. Uh, of course, they don't always show up, but uh, assuming they're there, they get some perception of what they're learning. They may not have a good idea of what they could be learning, right? That that is a that remains to be seen. But uh, I can't tell you how many economic students have told me when I meet them casually at a party or at a friend's, and I find out they're studying economics, and I say, um, you know, what do you what do you think of your professor? And they, sometimes this is you know tragically about someone in in my department. If I meet a student who's not in my class or in my class, but taking other classes. And I'll say, what do you think of that professor? And they say, well, you know, he really knows his stuff, but he's, he has trouble communicating it. And uh, that's always to me a red flag that the person either doesn't know their stuff or they're trying to dumb down their graduate level theoretical training to an undergraduate level that it just isn't very effective. And so I think a lot of people – come to hate their economics classes because uh, either because they're really hard because they weren't prepared for the math uh, or uh, they're really easy. They're good at math and it's a breeze for them. It's low-level math. So for them, for math students, technical STEM type students, engineering majors, it's relatively easy and they don't get much out of it. Um, and I think that's the tragedy. You know, my classes, I never used calculus at the um, – when I taught undergraduates, it just, uh, I think, misses what we are capable of delivering, which is the yeah, insights I, I into how the world works. 
So to go back to your question, I think the my answer would be that uh, a lot of students aren't paying for the knowledge. They're paying uh, for the piece of paper. Uh, this is what Brian Kaplan's answer would be. You know, Brian, we've had Brian on to talk about economics as signal, education as signaling. And uh, he makes the very, to me, very telling point that when class, class is canceled, professor has an emergency, can't make the class. And they just, you know, in college, you just cancel it. They don't send a substitute. They just get one less class. Sometimes you make it up, but if you don't make it up, no one, no one gets, often people don't get mad. <laughs> they don't say like, well, wait a minute. They're going to get the same diploma. Yeah, I, four I paid for, in fact, it not. the best situation would be you just cancel all the classes and uh, you get an A. And a lot of people have given that choice if no one knew that's what actually happened, uh, might be might be happy about that. But that's that's not proof that it's signaling. It's just it's a suggestive. It's not it's it's an interesting hypothesis. But that would be my answer in general for why right. college education is so poorly uh, performed relative to the price, which is you're only education is only part of what you're paying for. You're paying for the chance to mingle with other people. You're paying for a, a signal that you're that you're smart, that you have proof of that. You have a credible piece of paper to prove that. But you could argue that if you're going to get that, what you could just you could learn something along the way, <laughs> couldn't you? So it is, Why not? It yeah, is, you're there. Uh, but I think so. Part of it, I think is your answer is correct, which is I don't think people know either the parents or the students what a great class in many disciplines might be, and. Um, you know, I used to say when I taught economics, it should change the way you look at the world. It should give you a lens. So that's what we want to try to do today. Um, any other preliminaries before we get started? No, let's go. Okay, so I want to start with a simple question. Again, some of these questions we'll have talked about last time, but I want to try to go maybe a little bit deeper. And along the way, we'll try to come up with some other examples that are analogous. So I want to start with an easy one. Uh, a seemingly easy one. And just as a one more piece of int introduction to the listening audience, if you try to answer these, you know, you might want to put the put the episode on pause and think about them as we as we mention them. Uh, and I have one piece of advice for those of you out there listening, trying to answer these problems. If your first thought is something you could have come up with without taking an economics class, it's probably not the answer we're looking for. It may be right. Uh, there may be some fact about the world that is central that you know and that you think is dis you know descriptive of the answer, helps find the answer, but usually uh, there requires some knowledge of economics. So my first question is um, why is old wine, wine that's been aged, it's uh, an older vintage, why is it uh, more expensive in the store than uh, immature new wine that hasn't been aged much? And what is the answer to that, Bob? Yeah, I'd, I'd say that one in general is straightforward, whether whether or not the magnitude of the difference is well accounted for by this explanation would be another question to discuss. But uh, if you if you have an asset, namely a bottle of wine that you could sell now, uh, then by selling it now, you could put the money in the bank and earn interest every year. Uh, if you wait five years before selling it, it's just sitting there in your cellar or, or wherever it's stored. Uh, and if it weren't going to increase in price during those five years that it was just sitting there, uh, you'd be much better off selling it today. And so that's the, the clear prediction of economic theory, that if you have an asset uh, and you're, you could sell it now or you could hold it, the only uh, way it would be rational to continue holding it for the time being is that its price is going up at least as rapidly as the interest you could earn if you sold it down, put the money in the bank. So that's, that's our theory. Uh, now, sometimes uh, old wines just become scarce. They all get drunk. And so there's a, there's an additional factor to throw in uh, to, to come up with the size of the price differential, but that's the basic explanation I'd offer. And I think that's right, and I want to try to give a few different uh, applications of that. In fact, it might be our entire uh, episode may be focused on that. That's a pretty simple idea, what you just said. Um, but what I want to th you to think about out there as you think about these kind of problems is your answer when you first thought about it might have been, 
Well, old wine's better than I mean, excuse me. Old wine's better than new wine. Wine that's been aged, that's that's of an older vintage, is better, and so people are willing to pay more for it. And that's true. That is also true. And what we're going to be applying here are uh, what Alfred Marshall called the two blades of the scissor. At least that's what we're often going to be applying, which for supply and demand, even in cases where perhaps there's not perfect competition, because there's no such thing really. But one of the things I want to push as we talk about these examples is the role of cost. So a lot of times when we see differences in prices like in wine, we tend to assume that we're being, you know, exploited, say, that uh, because we like old wine, they can charge us more. But if the cost of old wine and new wine were the same, if the inventory effect that, that you were talking about, Bob, weren't there, uh, the price of old wine and new wine – would be identical. And if old wine yeah, tasted and in that better, case, the merchants would, would sell the wine right when it came into their possession. And if they liked old wine better, but if people liked old wine better than new wine and the costs were the same, there'd be no new wine on the market. Nobody would buy it. So there wouldn't be this differential. The fact that the differential right. is there is a combination of the fact that people prefer old wine to new wine. They're willing to pay more. Because cost alone is not sufficient. Neither side of the cost demand, supply demand is sufficient. I used to give my students the following you question. Need yeah, I'm going to give this to you, Bob. Easy one, okay? Um, <laughs> you, it's a layup. Uh, and you can, you can challenge me anytime along the way. We did not prepare this uh, in great detail. So uh, it makes it a little more fun. So uh, you come into my shoe store. I'm in the mall. And you come in to buy a, a pair of shoes and they're um, – they're two hundred and fifty dollars, and you'd been in another store recently where they were sixty, and you say, and they're really great shoes. They're fantastic shoes. You'd pay two fifty. They're they're worth say four hundred to you. They last long and they're really hip right now, and they're really uh, in vogue. Really cool pair of somethings, and um, you come into my store and you're and you're a little you're shocked that they're two fifty, and I say, well, they're two fifty because. Um, to have higher costs this this week, um, my my daughter's getting married, and I've got a, it's a really nice wedding, and I need to raise a little more money, so I'm I'm just raising the price uh, just this week. And what would your answer to be me to me? What would you say? Well, if I know I can get them somewhere else for sixty, uh, I would say your daughter's wedding is your problem, it's not Ex my problem. Right. So costs, or if I'd said, oh, but but we had a flood in the store this week, and my insurance went up a lot. So I've got to charge more or, you know, I've got this employee. I really, I really like him. He's fantastic. And I'm paying him one of my salesmen $200,000 a year. So I've got to, you know, I got to make it back on the, on the shoes. Can you blame me? What would you do? Not going to work. Yeah. I think the customer really wants to buy the, the product at the most favorable price he can, he can find. And, if it's on offer elsewhere for less, the fact that you need money is not really an issue. So the simple way to think about this is for me, and I don't know if you think about this way, but competition tends to drive prices down towards costs. Uh, but it's the costs of that are out there for, for lots of suppliers. Your own personal costs are irrelevant. And in some industries and in some situations, you can really think about the cost of providing the item. Uh, in this case, old wine versus new wine, the cost is the foregone investment opportunity. You can t you can make – that number might be a high number because you could want, I want to take more risk. But if you think about that as risk-adjusted, we all pretty much have the same opportunities to invest. And so you'd expect all wine to be more expensive than new wine because there's just no way for merchants to compete and drive the price down any more than, than they already do. They try. They'd like to because they'd like to attract the business, but they're going to make a nice uh, – they're going to make a profit above and beyond their costs. And in this case, the key cost to, to pay attention to is the the fact that you tie up your money in the item if it's uh, an older item. Yep. That works for me. Do you know the expression, the, uh, the low-hanging fruit principle? No. Always pick the low-hanging fruit first. 
Nope, it's the same idea, right? Yeah, th this is, this is uh, an embodiment of that same idea. Why should you pick the low-hanging fruit first? Well, it's easier to pick. That means you can pick more of it on day one. Pick it on day one, sell it, put, it, put the uh, proceeds in the bank, and you'll earn interest for the, the duration of the season. If you wait to pick the low-hanging fruit last, uh, then you'll get, have a smaller deposit on day one, and you'll earn less interest. So it's, it's the exact same principle. Okay, now here's a hard one. You ready? This is a really hard Go. one. This is a really <laughs> hard one. Okay. And for those of you listening at home, your first answer is wrong. And that's my warning to you, Bob, too. Okay. All right. Okay, so I'm on guard. And it's it, what's beautiful about this is it's it's a it's an application of this principle. So what happens to the price of pork when the price of corn goes up? What happens to the price of pork when the price of corn goes up? And we will assume, which a student raises, raises his hand, do pigs eat corn? Yes, they do. We're going to assume that's true, even if it's not. Otherwise, it's a very tough question. Um, so what happens to the price of pork when one of its inputs gets more expensive? Yeah, I, I think uh, you you could probably find or construct an example where the answer could go in either direction. The price of pork would go up or down. But I'm going to say that when the price of corn goes up, that means the cost of bringing hogs to market goes up. And with it, the price of pork goes up. That's correct. And the again, the logic is just what you said. And it's just what we've been applying, which is. Well, if costs are higher for everybody, the price of pork, which uses corn, is going to have to go uh, up. Otherwise, people will leave that up, that industry, and the price would readjust, and that would pull people back in, et cetera. But actually, that's only true in the long run. So in the short run, and this is why it's a, such a interesting uh, question, in the short run, you would expect the price of pork to go down not up. And the reason, so th so Bob, the answer you gave is, is for those of you um, drawing this at home, you know, the supply curve shifts up and to the left, you get a new higher price, and that's uh, the end of the story. But in the short run, the you could argue that the supply of pork shifts down and to the right. Uh, and the reason is, is that uh, to produce a pig takes corn, but the other thing it takes, it takes space and Nutrition, other nutritional elements and medicine and who knows what else, but it also takes time. So there's some optimal amount of time that I'm going to let pass before I harvest my pig. And here's a side note, uh, just a wonderful application of economics. When should I harvest my pig? Uh, what's the... What's the key economic variable that, that I need to look at when I'm trying to decide whether to let my pig live for another year versus slaughter it and take the money now? And the answer is? This is the same as the old wine question. Yep. You know, yep. If, if the pig is growing in net value faster than the investment yield would be if you sold him now, then you should keep him at the trough. For a little while longer. Otherwise, now's the time to sell him. So in general, I'm going to slaughter a pig, chop down a tree, drain my oil, oil reserve. It, this is a very general problem when its, its net return is roughly equal to the rate of interest, the rate of interest I can earn on a, on a relatively right. similar investment. So I'm going to cheat and just call it the rate of interest as if there were one. The reason being is that if the rate's growing faster than the rate of interest, I should leave the pig in the ground. I should leave it alive. If it's growing slower than the rate of interest, I should chop it down. I should I slaughter it and take the money and put it in the bank where it grows faster than it's been growing as a pig. So when the price of corn goes up, there are going to be pigs that are – too big at the current rate of price of corn to allow to make it right. economic worth economically worthwhile for them to be uh, left alone for another period of time 
it's too late. I can't chop them down yesterday, slaughter them yesterday, but I should slaughter them now. And of course, as farmers try to do that, they will find that the price of, of pork goes down. I want to thank my old uh, friend Dan for that. Uh, I think I think Dan understood that better than I did when we uh, studied that in no, graduate that's, school. That's a nice example, yeah, and very very well uh, articulated. Uh, students are sometimes surprised when uh, they they hear this reasoning and realize that the best time to chop down a, a a lumber tree, a tree that's not valued for any other reason than if they're going to make pulp out of it or, or cheap wood products. The the best time to chop that tree down is not when it's reached its maximum size. Exactly. But when its rate of growth slows to the real rate of interest. And that presumes that, which I think is biologically true, that trees grow at a decreasing rate after a while. They start off growing a lot in their first right. years, but then as they start to slow down, there comes a point where you should chop it down rather than get a little more growth out of it in its at it at its uh, current rate. Yeah, so that's a great point. You, you don't want it to grow to the maximum, and a tree is a great example because I don't think there's much maintenance of a tree. It's unlike a pig. Uh, so there, I think right. the, the the tree you really you really want to look at the growth rate relative to the rate of interest with the tree. You need to, with the pig. You want to look at the net. I think you want to look at the net profit relative to the rate of interest. It's a little trickier. Right. Um, it's not just the growth rate of the, of the, it's not just the weight that it, that it adds. Right. Um, no, it's, the, it's the net return from it. So now let's move on to a, a problem that uh, you raised, uh, that I think is related, uh, in your book. We talked about it last time, but now I think we have maybe some more artillery to, to, um, to tackle it, which is, it's a beautiful problem. Um, why is it that wedding dresses are typically bought rather than rented relative to tuxedos, which are typically rented rather than bought. The puzzle being that a wedding dress is usually worn once. That's definitely the modal number. There, there are probably wedding dresses that are worn more than once. But in general, the, the woman who buys the dress wears it once. The man who buys the tuxedo, if you bought a tuxedo, could wear it a few, many times in theory, could wear it to the next wedding. Even though it's not his, whereas the bride can't wear the dress to her next wedding. Right, right. So the, you'd think on the surface that people would rent wedding dresses but buy tuxedos. But that isn't what we see. So what explains that? Yeah, that, that question was submitted by a former student. I, I tell them to uh, pose and then try to answer an interesting question, one based on something you've – either experienced personally or have observed at close, at close hand. And, and this one came from uh, a young woman named uh, Jennifer Dulski, and she had gotten married six months before she enrolled in my course. And so this was very much on her mind. <laughs> she bought a wedding dress for several thousand dollars. Uh, uh, she knew already that it would sit in her closet for the next 20 or 30 years. Maybe she was hoping to have a daughter who might wear it, but that almost never happens. Uh, and then here's her husband who rents uh, a cheap tuxedo, uh, even though for sure he'll have 20 occasions in the, in the next two decades to wear a tuxedo. So why why didn't we do it in reverse was her question. Why didn't I rent the, the gown and he, he buy the tuxedo? And, just, and her answer. I'm going uh, to give yeah, the wrong the, answer. I'm going to give the wrong answer first. Can I give the wrong right, answer go, first? Go. So, yeah, sure. So, so the wrong answer, I think, again, I want to alert listeners to just try to fight this impulse I think a lot of people think, well, women care a lot about their wedding dress, so they get taken advantage of. I mean, they just get sold this thing for five thousand or three thousand dollars, whatever it is, and they pay it anyway because it's so important to them. Whenever you make an answer like that, you want to ask, well, why isn't there somebody out there who's going to try to make a profit selling it for less or renting it? And if that's not happening, maybe there's a huge profit opportunity out there, but it's very more like it's often the case that there's a cost there you haven't thought of, and so take right. it away. I, I tell students who offer explanations like that to to uh, hear alarm bells going off in their head when they realize that they've just offered a cash on the table explanation, uh, by which I mean one that assumes that merchants are out there sitting idly by, even though they could, with a very simple offer, increase their profits. Substantially. So, if somebody's paying five thousand dollars for a wedding gown that costs the merchant only a thousand dollars, 
why doesn't some other merchant offer that wedding gown for $4,000 and then make uh, a quick $3,000 extra profit by taking the business away from the one who was charging her 5,000 or rent it so, yeah, at, or any, rent it at a low at a or, relatively low price but still enough to make a lot of money and rent it again <laughs> make make more money so so Jennifer's Jennifer's explanation did start with a pretty strong assumption but it's not one that uh, too many people seem inclined to quarrel with and that was that it's more important for women than it is for men to make a fashion statement on big social occasions. Yeah. What now, why that is would be an interesting discussion that we could have uh, in addition to this one, but set that to one side. Uh, no one seems to quarrel with that assumption. No, they don't. I, I've described this example in lots of different countries and, and it seems to be pretty much that way everywhere. If you take that assumption as given, then it has very clear implications for the economics of trying to organize a rental market in gowns. So you want to you want to make a fashion statement. That means uh, that for a rental company to serve your needs, it would have to have what 30, 40 gowns in each size, or else uh, it, you'd you'd risk d different styles of gowns in each size, or or you'd risk showing up at your wedding in a gown just like someone else had worn at a wedding weeks earlier. Or, or worse, and if you one that wasn't flattering to your particular body, which is also another aspect of this. We don't have to go into the details, but it's easier to tailor, I think, a yes. tuxedo to yeah, a man. Yeah, that's the second factor. Is the, is we're the less complicated. Issue. Let's just say we're less complicated yeah, physically. Yeah, there's a lot more uh, custom tailoring yeah. involved in, in a wedding dress than in a tuxedo fitting. But. But if you're trying to make a statement, then uh, the huge inventory that a rental company would have to carry would mean that those gowns, most of them would re get rented out only once or twice a year, uh, maybe once every two or three years. The the carrying costs of that industry would of, of that inventory would be so large that you'd have to charge a rental fee so high to cover those costs that it would be maybe 110 percent of the purchase price of the gown. And who would pay more than the purchase price of the gown to rent the gown when you could buy the gown for just the, the straight purchase price? So that that was her explanation. The the, the groom, he doesn't care apparently, uh, and this seems uh, like a, a fairly reasonable assumption too. They, men don't seem to mind that they're wearing a suit just like the suits that other guys wore to big occasions a few weeks earlier. If you don't mind that, then a rental company can satisfy your needs by having two or three suits in every size. And those suits are going to rent out probably seven or eight or 10 times during the year. And that means you can rent them for a quarter or a third of the purchase price. And if you're trying to save a few bucks uh, at a time when money's tight, that's that's the route to go. It, it's not only just like the the tuxedo somebody wore recently. It, it is the tuxedo, <laughs> which, is, exactly. which is another part yeah. of it. It's fascinating yeah. to me because it's not and, that and we pleasant. Don't, and we just don't care. <laughs> we we got. don't know. It does get uh, – It. I think it gets cleaned in between, uh, pretty sure. Um, and, and to make it more interesting, of course, uh, typically I suspect not for every tuxedo but often – uh, people might buy parts of the tuxedo outfit combo uh, and and rent other parts. So they might buy a tuxedo shirt. Uh, they might buy a pair of shoes that could go with the tuxedo, even though they may not be the shiny, uh, super shiny kind. You can get away with it, I found, uh, with a pair of dark shoes that have been shined, black shoes that have been shined a great deal. You don't have to rent the tuck shoes also. Same with the cufflinks you might have or a bow tie. You might have some of those items or choose to buy them because you might be able to wear them in other parts of your life. But the tux itself, it's a few times a year, maybe once a year. And when you're younger, it's zero after a year until for a while. Uh, and that's why it's not a very good investment to buy one when you're younger unless you get invited to a lot of galas, uh, which most of us don't when we're 20. Do you 20s. own a tux? I Russ, do. Can I ask? Yeah, I rented one for my wedding. Uh, and then at some point when I realized I was wearing – getting invited to other weddings and to dinners where I had to dress in a tux, I bought one. Uh, and I'm ashamed to say it may not fit me right now, which is another issue. <laughs> How about you? I, I own one. I own one also. In fact, uh, it's the one I, I wore on my wedding. And I'm embarrassed to report to you that I have on at least two occasions I can think of – 
accepted invitations to go to a formal event simply because I owned a tux. Uh, these are events I would have uh, chosen not to attend if I could have gone in a business suit. I wanted to get my money's worth uh -huh. out of that tux that was sitting in, in my closet. Now, uh, uh, our students, yours and mine, know that that's completely irrational. It's a sunk cost. We should, we should wear it to an event only if we want to go to the event. Um, if the pleasure we'll get from the event uh, is greater than the costs that we'll actually incur going to the event. But uh, somehow humans seem to have built into them uh, a, a hardwired desire to save money. And, and if you think you're saving money by wearing a tux that you own, that's well, just I'm, an extra push to attend an event like that. I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt, despite your, <laughs> despite your self-assessment. I'm going to try the following, okay? Maybe it's not that you want to get your money's worth out of the tux. It's not that you wanted to bring down the per unit cost, which is you know the same mistake – People make when they order business cards. Let's see. Uh, if I order a hundred, they're they're a dime. But if I order five thousand, they're seven cents. I'll, well, that's cheaper. I'll get five thousand. <laughs> if you don't need five thousand, it doesn't matter that they're seven cents. You're actually losing money. So y you do need to take that into account. So, I, but I, here's my e explanation. I'm going to argue that you didn't think sunk costs were sunk. You didn't think, well, I can lower the per per use cost of my tux if I go out and have a miserable time. <laughs> Maybe you wanted the thrill of preening and prancing around and being the object of great admiration in your talk. So it's true that if it, if it had been a business suit, you wouldn't have gone because it's not that interesting an event. And, of course, all the listeners who know Bob out there are thinking, I wonder, was that my wedding? No. Um, but – Maybe you just like the way you looked in the tux and you just felt – it just it gave I, you a I think lift. I'm going to be – more eager to, to cop to being irrational <laughs> than I am to, to embrace that alternative explanation. It's creative, though, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's very good. <laughs> but I'm not, I'm not going to own, own that one. Okay. So um, the other question I have for the listeners out there, and I'll ask it for you too, of you too, but I think I know the answer. Does anybody own more than one tux? Like how many suits do you own? Me personally, I yeah. own about three suits. I think currently, I've owned many over the over the years, but I think I've still got three in my closet. And I have two. I have a charcoal gray and a navy and a navy blue. Uh, I I have I have a lot of sport coats, many of which I don't wear anymore. I'm ashamed to say that's another separate issue. But I think a lot of men. I think we're on the low end. We're academics. We. I assume we have lots of listeners out there who have lots of different men, male listeners who have lots of suits. But I wonder if any of them have multiple tuxedos. And I, I, I mean tuxedos that they wear with any regularity, that they like to mix it up. They Sometimes they like the one with this lapel and that lapel. You know, obviously there's powder blue ones that might not be appropriate. You got you bought for some special occasion that might be, you know, might be different. But um, most people, I think most men who own a tux own one. I'd be surprised. If anyone out there wants to let us know, we'd, we'd love to hear. <laughs> uh, okay, so any other comments on the wedding dress or the tux? I'm going to move on to a different application. Go. So uh, I raised this question, uh, I, I think, in my blog uh, sometime in the past. It, it, it's, a, um, it, to me, a, a fascinating application of this, and there's another variation on it related to tuxedos, but we'll start with this one first. If I go on vacation and I rent a car at the airport – uh, if I'm vacationing in Miami or uh, California that gets a lot of tourist traffic where a lot of people there are going to be on vacation for a week or two and going to be renting a car, first thing is is that the rental rate is, is often lower in those places than it is in a place like Duluth, Minnesota that doesn't get as much uh, tourist traffic. And you might think, well, it should go the other way. The, the more – Visited places, they, the bigger tourist destinations have a higher demand, and they, therefore that should push up the price of, of the rental car. But again, you might want to think about what the cost side of that is before you come to that conclusion. And then the second point, though, is that if I'm on a vacation and I want to rent a bicycle, I'm in California and I want to rent a bike to ride along uh, the ocean, uh, or I'm in uh, a beautiful city and I want to cruise around on a bike, it's often more expensive to rent the bicycle 
than it is to rent the car on a per day basis. And that's surprising. So what are your thoughts on those two puzzles? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, the, the price of renting a car, uh, I don't know if you've had experience in that market going back over decades, uh, they've gotten an enormously more efficient at renting cars to people uh, over the time span I've had a chance to witness. It used to be much, much more expensive. And until recently in Europe and elsewhere, it was much, much more expensive to rent a car than it is now. And I think uh, the reason car rental prices have come down so much is that they've just uh, really honed their act uh, to a, a a, a fine edge in in every uh, stage of the supply chain. They they buy cars at an incredible discount. When they liquidate their fleet after a year, they they auction off the rental cars. They've got fifteen or twenty thousand miles on them. Uh, they fetch prices at auction that are not all that different from the prices they paid for the cars when new. Ford gives huge discounts to rental car companies like Avis and Hertz because. They use those sales to say we sold more sedans than any other company. Blah blah blah. And they buy so in, they get, and they, they buy get, in bulk, which helps a little bit. They, they buy get. in bulk. They they uh, they make a lot of extra money by selling you insurance. Uh, you you should know that if you already have insurance on your car, which most car renters do, uh, you're getting uh, charged an exorbitant fee for the insurance. So if you take out the insurance. Uh, premiums that they charge and the the money they charge you for gasoline if you don't put gas in the car yourself when you return it. That's the whole source of the rental car industry's profits. They make all their money off insurance and gasoline. Uh, Everything else is more or less uh, barely covering their direct costs of operation. Now, uh, it's the scale that makes those efficiencies possible. The volume discounts when they have the cars turned in. There's a whole queue of people. Uh, they can be transported to the airport all on, on a bus. You know, you don't have to do custom rides for the, the people. They, they hustle them through a car wash. It's all, all very mechanized. Uh, bike rentals is a much more custom thing. Uh, the, the scale is much, much smaller. They, they rent many fewer uh, bikes per day than a car rental place would in a day. And, and, They've got to tune the bike. They've got to change, adjust the the seat and the handlebars to fit users. It takes about 30 minutes worth of custom adjustment to get the forms filled out. Uh, contrast that with a rental car operation. You're out of there in, in literally seven minutes. So I think it's 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 the fact that they've really learned how to do this efficiently. That's that's the main reason for the, the surprising price comparison. So I want to raise two parts of that and see if, what your thoughts are. One is, I find I know this seems hard to believe, but uh, when we rent bikes as a family, uh, inevitably, one of them breaks, often more than one while we're out <laughs> riding around. Um, and I, I'm hesitant to suggest that the reliability of the bike is a big part of the cost uh, relative to a car. Because cars break in really expensive ways, but the fact is, is that in the in the first year of a car's life, uh, they don't break very much. So part of the decline in the and they're under warranty, of course. But I, I I'm, I'm wondering how often uh, a car rental at a major American airport from a major brand uh, has to be repaired. Um, they don't have a mechanic. That's, of course, one reason that they liquidate their fleet after right. <laughs> two years at, at the outside. Yeah, they they just don't want to be in the business of attending to motorists broken down on the highway. But in a but in a bike shop, there's there's always somebody tinkering, as you say, uh, trying to f- get the chain back on or reinflate the tire, uh, patch the tire. I, I just suspect that the frequency of act, of repair is higher for a bike. Having said that, you'd think that the time costs of the person repairing it would be a lot lower than the time costs of the person repairing a car. So you'd think that the that that would be a relatively small difference. Uh, but I don't know. But the other point I wanted to mention, which you which you just sort of mentioned in passing, I want to hammer on is that is is what you think of as the turnover. So any one bike. 
I don't think it's rented out very much. And you walk into the bike shop and there's, it's interesting. It's, it's more like a tuxedo shop than a wedding dress shop. Most of them, there, there's variation, right? Some bike shops, there's a lot of choices. There's different kinds of styles. You can do get a racing bike or a mountain bike or a, a tandem bike, et cetera. But, but a lot of times it's just, all, they only have really a few kinds. Typically, for example, when we're on vacation, it's a cruiser. It's a, it's a bike with a large seat and, and wide handlebars. And um, I don't know how often it gets rented. I don't know how large the variation is in in demand so that is one day radically different from another because I suspect – Well, the other thing is that uh, those demand variations I think uh, are much easier to address by moving the fleet of cars around than by moving the fleet of bikes around. People are driving cars from one city to the next all the time. If there's a peak demand in Miami in January, then uh, people who drive to Miami, well, that, those cars stay there and they rent them out in Miami. Uh, if, if they came from a place where demand's low, they don't send more cars back there. They don't need them. Uh, I don't th- think uh, there are national bike rental chains, at least I'm not aware of any. Uh, and given that the, the, you would have to transport the bikes yourself by putting them on a truck and, and paying for it rather than have your customer just drive it there for you as part of the, the rental arrangement, uh, it wouldn't really make sense to try to even out supply and demand across different geographic regions in a bike rental business, whereas you know that's a, a big part of the trade with car rental. But I suspect, again, if you're in, in – there's a predictability aspect of it. I think if you're – if you're Avis or Hertz in Miami or Enterprise and uh, it's a Wednesday in, in uh, January, you have a pretty good idea that you're going to be renting a lot of cars. And I just wonder how much, how much erratic uh, is the demand for bike rental at a particular shop because if, if that is the case, you're going to have to carry often – you want to carry a lot of more bikes than you'd prefer just to make sure that you don't send a customer without right. uh, without a bike because then they are li- not very likely to come back. Of course, for tourists, it's not so important. It's a separate issue. Um, it's another part of this that, that we didn't mention. But it on the surface, given that a bike might rent for 30 to 40 or $50 a day, which is similar to what a car rents for, even – uh, is if you're in my case, you don't, I never get the insurance. Uh, it would imply that the bike person's making a ton of money, and that there's an enormous profit opportunity in, in bike rental, in running a bike shop. And I don't think that's the case. So, no, no, no. There's that. That would again be a cash on the table explanation, yeah. and and we just know enough by now to be skeptical of those. Yeah, so I I just uh, there must there may be some costs there that um, they were not aware of. There's one other one that's important, by the way, that we didn't talk about, which is and what I love about these kind of problems is you think think about them. I've talked about this problem with I don't know. I've talked about it with my family. Uh, I've talked about it with other economists, but I just realized another aspect, which is that the uh, real estate where these places are located are very different. So the bike rental shop is usually in a very high rent area that's a nice part of town where the tourists like to go, whereas the car rental place by the airport is usually very low land costs. Of course, it takes up a lot more space, though, so that would go the other direction. It's, um, I don't know, it's a bit of a puzzle. Somebody out there, I'm sure, has worked in a bike shop and knows more than I do about uh, the maintenance costs and the and the profitability, so I encourage encourage them to write in. Uh, any other comments on this, Bob? No, my wife and I rented bikes in Boulder uh, in the fall. They they were at least 30 minutes attending to one thing or another before we were out of the shop with our bikes. So, you know, there's a lot of custom attention you get. Maybe there's some way to cut down on that if yeah. they could have bigger scale, but the scale is just not there to allow it. And I, I guess part of it is also... Um, Actually, you usually don't rent the bike for a day. You rent it for a couple hours, and a good chunk of that is often just getting the seat right, getting the height of the seat adjusted. Right? right. right? If it took that long to get you into your car, I mean, we, like you say, you walk around the car to look for damage. That takes about a minute and a half. Uh, there usually isn't any. I've never, I don't know if I've ever seen much of any significance in a rental car. You throw your bag in the back, you jump in, you back out, and you're out of there. 
um, the bike shop takes a lot longer. Uh, so that's got to be part that exposure to the staff and the fact that the bike can't be rented for that half hour, either on the out or the return, uh, the exit or the return is uh, is got to be part of the cost too. So uh, let's close with a really fun one from um, not in this uh, frame of costs and uh, and uh, competition, but it's just it's such a fun one. Uh, the Nigerian scam, the email scam. What's the question? Yeah, the the former student who wrote about this uh, said that she lived in Nigeria long ago and. There were the Nigerian prince scams uh, being run two, three decades ago. But then now back in the States, she gets the very same emails. There's a prince who's got hundreds of millions of dollars. And if you'll just uh, pay a a fee of $1,000, you can be certified as the transfer recipient of this money. And you'll get a, a $10 million commission for helping us get the money from Nigeria to wherever uh, the prince is, is coming in the U.S. Uh, and and it's such a preposterous story. Uh, her question was, why on earth can't they come up with a bit better cover story after all these years? <laughs> right. And, and you and I, even, so even if you're you're naturally suspicious of a free lunch, right? Uh, <laughs> if if you've you you probably seen an article about this somewhere, right? So it, even right. if you even if you thought maybe it's true. You see an article that says it's a scam, and so wh- why don't they try something different? Well, her her answer was that uh, the the scammers actually have a, an interest in floating an implausible cover story. That's not a bug. That's a feature <laughs> from their point of view. They don't want people like you and me responding to their overtures. We're skeptical. We're going to quickly stumble onto the fact that it's a scam and, and, and bail out in a hurry. What they want is the, is the most gullible 1% of the population and anybody who would respond to a clumsy cover story like the one they offer is almost for sure in that narrow slice of the population. It's a, it's a feature of their pitch. And they don't read that article that I mentioned that talks <laughs> about it being a scam. They don't see it. Right. Right. Um, I will say uh, two things come to mind. There, there's a remarkable um, Siri ad right now where uh, – let me just see if I got this right. Um, yeah, it's um, – Bill Hader, the actor, is is sitting <laughs> eating lunch and, and Siri asks him if – on his iPhone, if he wants to to uh, respond to hear his email, and Siri reads him the email, which is that he has a chance to make a huge amount of money from uh, some. <laughs> I don't think it's Nigerian, but it's some similar type of scam. And and Siri says, "Shall I respond?" And he says, "Yeah." <laughs> it's a very strange jag. That's the way it ends, because the humor of it is is that we all know it's a fake, and that he's been uh-huh. somehow uh, fooled. Uh, to, he's missed it somehow. He's missed the the fact that this is always a fake. The other thing I want to mention is is that while it's true that there is this oldie but goodie out there, uh, I don't get it much anymore. I used to get those. In the early days of email, I would get them. I don't get them anymore. They they probably, maybe they do still try them with some people who they think might be more skeptical. Oh, I, I definitely get them. You still get them? Yeah, okay. I get them uh, with about the same frequency as ever. But there is innovation in this field. I just want to make it <laughs> make it clear. Uh, I'm laughing, but it's tragic. My, um, or at least potentially tragic. My my parents, who were in their 80s, were almost scammed by someone who called them and uh, represented themselves as a friend of my oldest son, saying that my son had uh, they'd gone on a to a on a vacation or on a trip they'd gone into to mexico they'd gotten arrested falsely and they needed money to get out of uh jail and my father that's a good one my father yeah, that, heard that, my that son would suck in a lot of people my father heard my son crying on the phone 
and was told, of course, don't call the parents because it's so embarrassing. You know, he doesn't want to, the parents doesn't want me to know, but if you could just help him out as the grandparent. And uh, my dad was suspicious, but not not terribly suspicious because he was pretty sure he'd talked to my son who was sobbing. And I took, he, he, he asked with trepidation because he felt he might be betraying his grandson's trust. He said, do you know where, where he is? And I said, I do. <laughs> he actually was out of town, which was somewhat ominous for me. But I said, I'm pretty sure he's not in Mexico. I'm uh, pretty sure that trip, did, which was supposed to go to Western Maryland, didn't end up in Mexico, but it could have, I guess. But the key was, I said, I thought about it for a minute. I did two things while I was while I was talking. Uh, one is I tried to see whether they had said my son's name or whether uh, he had. And of course, he had. They had said, we have your, your grandson. And they and he started sobbing and, and my father blurted out his name rather than hearing it from the the, the uh-huh. scammers. Uh, the other thing I did is I quickly started Googling um, Mexico bail scam grandson, and I found it. <laughs> and so, you know, my dad, I, I told my dad in the future, although I understood why he was so scared, it was very well done. Uh, he saved himself $10,000 by calling me and taking a chance. But he can always, you know, if you get on, it's amazing how many of these scams are available on Google as a, as some kind of a story. Uh, so. Well, that's an important point uh, to make when you study basic economics. I mean, the, all the power of the invisible hand, the, the profit motive that lures producers to introduce quality improvements and cost-saving innovations, uh, that same motive all but guarantees that if there's uh, any way to cheat somebody out of out of some money, there'll be somebody there willing and eager to do it. So caveat emptor, grandparent emptor. Uh, I mean, yes, caveat exactly. grandparent, sorry. <laughs> My Latin <laughs> let me down there. Uh, w- when you think there's uh, either the, it's, it's a fascinating actually, when you think there's a free lunch, be wary. But also when you think there's a, uh, that you're, you have this opportunity to, to save someone, uh, I, it, even if they're not Nigerian, you might want to Google it to see if uh, you're um, you're about to be taken to the cleaners instead of to Nigeria. So, yep. <laughs> My guest today has been Robert Frank. Robert, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Always a pleasure, Russ. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.